know, we all need you all the time. Bus driver up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for those of you who joined us in person, and I hope the rest of you online can hear us well. Give us a thumbs up if all is good. Uh, today, we are joined by Dr. Paul Melendez from the Eller College of Management, where he's been since 1996. Yes. Yes, and in addition to that, he also earned his uh, doctoral degree there, specializing in uh, privatization. You'll have to tell us a little bit more about that. He's also an author. Congratulations on the follow through. So many people talk about writing books, but never yeah. actually do. <laughs> so good job on actually writing the book. It's called uh, Moral uh, Problems in Management. And, uh, objective model of analysis. So I, I, that's interesting too. So why don't I go ahead and uh, turn the floor over to you and uh, tell us a little bit about what we're gonna learn today. Sure, well, you know, first of all, thank you for having me here. I, I fully realize that this is in the middle of summer, right? People still are, are working remote and uh, you know, it's lunchtime. So that, right. I, I've got a few things that I'm competing against, but uh, <laughs> it's wonderful to see that you have the technology here and that we'll be able to Kind of memorialize this and send it out to the general exactly. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, uh, native Tucsonan. Um, if you're curious about what privatization means, it, it, for many of you, you probably have heard the concept. It's when we take kind of goods and services, if you will, out of the government sector and you begin to put them into the private sector. And you know, for me, that's really interesting because there are lots of pros and cons. It comes down to what specifically you're talking about. Um, when I did that years ago, I probably could have never anticipated the relevance and how that would kind of back up into this broader discussion about ethics. Um, but that's a little bit about what that is. Right, so um, really happy to be here today. Let me go ahead and share with you uh, kind of an overview. And I realize that we have a little bit of time, so I'm going to come at you pretty fast uh, at a pretty high level, but there will always be opportunities to, to kind of at the very end ask questions and then go into this in more detail. So I want to start out by talking about some breaches in trust at a macro level that um, I've made note of, and I'm sure may, maybe many of you have as well. Then I want to talk a little bit about human nature. And, and the reason why I put human nature out there is because I get asked many times, uh, what is your philosophy, right, for teaching business ethics per se? Um, I want to get into root causes of uh, unethical behavior. Uh, talk a little bit about what I like to dub as the, the ethical gray zone, right? Uh, when things aren't black or white necessarily, mm -hmm. but you've got shades of gray. Yeah, <laughs> it depends, that's right. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, moral problems in management, which is, as you mentioned, Heather, kind of one of the main, main focal points of my text uh, with McGraw-Hill. And then I'm going to provide you kind of a, an overview of my objective model of analysis. It's, it's a model that I've used extensively, not just in the classroom with undergrads and grad students. I can tell you I've used it equally with companies across the world because they have a real interest in this. Everybody runs into an ethical dilemma, whether it's of a personal or of a professional nature. And one of the things that I've made an argument for for decades is that it's very natural for us to deviate back to what we think and feel, right? In terms of trying to figure out what the dilemma is, much less how to resolve it. That only takes you so far, as many of you probably know. So, and that's largely because it's very subjective, right? We are all different, right? That's what makes us so special. So this objective model of analysis is really designed for leaders and managers in the business, government, and nonprofit sectors when they're facing a dilemma to have a, a more objective set of criteria to run the dilemma through, right? So I'm gonna talk about stakeholder interests, economic outcomes, requirements, and also ethical duties as a way of kind of approaching those dilemmas. And of course, we've got to do a little bit of a, of a sample. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, of a case study, one of the more recent cases that I wrote. And also I have an invitation for the Tucson Metro Chamber, which I'm gonna say to the very end, which I, I hope we have many taking up on. Okay. Okay, so let me start out with uh, a few large um, breaches of ethics in society. <clears throat> so if this were a Richter scale, these would probably measure around at eight. Cool. So these were significant. This first one has to do with a company. So this is a business example. So I want you to kind of track with me on these examples. This is a business example, and this involves a company by the name of Wirecard. Okay. 
they've never heard of Wirecard. It's a German-based uh, payment processing company. This is this has become to Germany what Enron was to the United States. It will forever change their accounting and auditing practices uh, into the foreseeable future. So what do they do? Well, the better question I sometimes ask is what didn't they do, right? I mean, everything from money laundering to fraudulently you know, creating a call accounts to falsifying you know, P&Ls. And, and this was not, not a small uh, fraud. This was to the tune of $2 billion. And as you get into the case and you begin to understand what happened, it, it involves auditors and it involves some of our big four accounting firms, right? That had tried to flag some of the irregularities and, and some of the real deliberate attempts by uh, senior leadership at Wirecard to really kind of throw off some of the other um, uh, auditors with, with EY. So it's, it's large. Now, <clears throat> this is an example of what I like to call a breach of shareholder trust. So imagine for a minute, if you were a shareholder, right, of a company like Wirecard, what does it look like for you right now? Think of the loss of valuation, the fact that the company is now kind of facing insolvency. This is a huge breach of trust, right? Because what we expect if we own stock or positions in companies is that, you know, the CEO and senior leadership are going to be, you know, fiduciaries, right? Responsible fiduciaries for, you know, shareholders. So in this case, you have a clear breach of shareholder trust, right? So you see how I'm kind of approaching this? Let's go now to the next sector, which is the government sector. <clears throat> So when you see this image, Heather, what, what jumps out at you? Big bag of money. Yes. Uh, what does it say? Pandemic preparedness drill. Oh. You kind of see where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. Some of you have a little recollection. So <clears throat> let me refresh your memory. So right as the pandemic uh, became public in the US, when you think back to last year, we had congressional members that were privy to some closed door briefings on the magnitude of COVID-19. And so what did they do with that information? Just like we think a little bit about business investors, right? Using insider information, they acted on it. And uh, this is something that, uh, you know, quite frankly, uh, cut across both aisles, right? This was not just a Republican or a Democratic uh, question. This had to do with spouses and, 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 and other kind of investors that were associated with these congressional members. But in this instance, you know, this is a clear breach of public trust, right? When we elect officials, whether it's at the you know, local, state, or federal levels, we elect them with the idea, right, that they're going to set aside their private interests, right, and, and put the public interests, you know, kind of front and center. And so to me, this is a clear breach of, of, of public trust which is different, it's still a breach of trust, but it's different than when you have executives of businesses or companies breach shareholder trust. And I'm sure you can see the differences. Let so, me interrupt you one second. Please. I'm realizing with our, our owl, if you actually stand right in front of your graphic, it will follow your voice oh. over to there. So that way you can be speaking and the graphic will be picked up at the same exact time. Perfect. How's so, that? Is this yep, working? so keep talking and the owl will slowly shift over to you. We're I guess the owl, here. yeah, the owl is wise apparently, right? It's, <laughs> okay, so you let me know, Heather, if, if, if we're still tracking here. So here's my third example. So we, we, I've given you an example from the business sector, an example from the government sector. So I'm gonna to look towards you and ask the question, where do you think this third, except, uh, this third example comes from? Okay. The nonprofit sector, right? The third sector. I overheard you a little bit before we began. So I, I happen to know or know a little bit about where you were. Do you remember uh, what happened with the National Rifle Association? I believe, didn't you have some little bit of private usage of some of those? Um, yeah. Yeah, we kind of had a pitched battle between the CEO and the president, right? You had you know, Oliver North and, and Wayne uh, LaPierre. Uh, this is not, in my opinion, about the Second Amendment, Amendment or what, what the NRA tries to pursue. This basically boiled down to an AG in New York saying this nonprofit organization has probably violated its very status, right? Looking at instances of misuse of, of charitable funds, grave concerns and issues with governance, which happens to be one of the areas that I have a lot of kind of specialty on. Um, it's, a, it's a list of 
red flags that, that should have been detected. And so in this instance, where you have the National Rifle Association, right, from the nonprofit sector, it's not a breach of shareholder trust. It's not necessarily a breach of public trust. It's more a breach of communal trust. Because if you think about, it, you know, for you, a person that works with a, non a nonprofit, or for those of us that are on boards or support various nonprofits, we trust, right, that the nonprofit is going to use those funds that we donated, right, and which have been specifically ear earmarked for specific purposes. And nonprofits that use those funds to, for purposes that are not specifically earmarked by those donors run into problems very quickly. Right. So all of these are examples of breaches of trust, but I, I do this because after 25 years, you know, being an academic and also, you know, kind of, you know, working with, with companies all over the world, it's important to understand that people are people, but how ethics and, and issues break, if you will, like a, like a, like a wave breaks on the shore can be a little bit different depending on the sector that you're talking about. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time not only getting everyone up to date up to date on some recent breaches, but how they're a little bit different with the three sectors. So I'm going to turn to you and ask you, what do you see in this image? What's the first one word? Go visceral. What's that one thing in the pit of your stomach? Chaos. Chaos. Okay. How about yourself? Bats. Bats. How about yourself? I see. Yin and the yang, and it's not scary. Have angels in your Ooh, very good. Did everyone catch that? This is an incredible illusion by the artist MC Escher. I've used this for decades. And it is because to me, it captures human nature. Oh, right? I see it now. Do you see it now? <laughs> so, so some of you may see angels, right? You see their wings and a little tutu, a life full of goodness, right? Others see the devil, right? With wings and horns and a in a world full of evil, right? <clears throat> and to me, this M.C. Escher uh, illusion is, is really always worked for me because I see humans in this world, right? We have that propensity to do both good and bad, right? I think it's always been that way. And in all truth, I think it will always be that way. So for me, as a professor that kind of focuses on business ethics, and, you know, I founded a center for, for, the, for uh, the Center for Leadership Ethics at the university, and we do some cutting edge research, we do lots of outreach, we teach a lot of classes at the undergrad and grad levels. This is my morning, right? And so I get asked this question a lot, and so I always find myself coming back to this because this is really how I feel. You know, I think I'm very much a humanist. I think people make mistakes. And, and it's for us to, you know, understand the nature of those mistakes and, and hopefully have enough people around us that will give us an opportunity maybe to try to, to make amends, right? So uh, I wanted to share this with you because if, if you're wondering how I approach ethics, this is probably a good way for you to remember uh, where I come back to. So let's talk about the root causes of unethical behavior. Um, what's a lot of fun whenever I do this with uh, professional associations, especially those that are focused on businesses, this should be no surprise, right? If anyone is familiar with accounting, uh, right, you know about forensic auditing, right? And this is the gift that keeps on giving, right? Um, every crime usually, on average, bubbles up at about that 22-month period, right? And what we have learned, or what I've taken from this field of forensic accounting, is that every crime involves motivation, opportunity, and rationalization. Now, motivation is not a bad thing, right? It's a pressure to achieve a particular need, right? It's not bad in and of itself. Opportunity isn't bad in and of itself, right? It's what I like to call the door that meets that pressure, right? That, that, that need that you're trying to satisfy. Now, rationalization is where it gets to be a little bit different, right? This is when we're about to do something and we get that feeling in the pit of our stomach that says, self, uh, you are kind of about to do something that maybe isn't okay, right? And this is how we rationalize, right? We say, but nobody's going to get hurt, right? Everybody else is doing it, right? The system's unfair, so I'm just trying to restore some justice. Do, do these sound familiar? Mm -hmm. If you are in business, I don't care if you're a public, private, nonprofit, or government agency, you can relate to this because when people get caught, there is usually a rationalization. So I bring these up because these are, again, some flags that pop up. Yes? 
I think it's interesting on the motivation part that you have a money symbol. Mm -hmm. Because in my experience, I feel like the motivation for this is usually ego. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and I would never disagree. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is that for the most part, when I talk to businesses, it's the pressure to whether it be meet quotas, right, hit certain sales targets, you know, achieve a certain bonus, right, um, that, that can be a really, really strong motivator. I mean, I totally agree with you, right? I, I walk around all the time trying to reset the button saying, look, people are motivated by many things. Money is one of them, but not always. And then they always look at me and say, really? No, it's all about money, right? But you're right. People are motivated by different things. I think for, for this, though, when we think about this in the business context and when people get trouble, yeah. it usually comes back here, right? So let me flesh this out for you a little bit more. Using a classroom experience and a corporate experience. How do you like that? So I can saddle the, the two worlds that I operate in all the time. So cheating is a big problem. It's only been heightened by the pandemic, right? With remote learning, right? And, and despite all the technologies, right? We know that a lot of this is occurring. So the problems that we're experiencing are happening at the K through 12, at the university levels and including graduate students. So I've thought about this for some time and have asked the question, all right, let's, uh, let's road test this, right? Let's give this a litmus test. And so here's what I've come up with. And this is also based on working with students over the last 25 years, unfortunately, and other professors trying to help them make sense of this and, and figure out what to do. So what's the driver? What's the motivation for students? They're under tremendous pressure, right? To earn good grades. So the question should be why? Well, there's a number of reasons, right? I mean, if you get good grades, you can either get a scholarship or stay on a scholarship, right? If you get good grades, it can impact career opportunities, right? There are some companies that won't even interview students unless they have a certain GPA. And of course, good grades can also impact your ability to go to graduate school, right? Um, it's a highly competitive environment, as we all know. And uh, good grades can be a significant differentiator, right? Not the only differentiator, not like motivation, you know, and the motivation for money is, is a key motivator, but it's not the only one. Well, here in this instance, you know, grades can be a big motivator, but not the only one. What's the opportunity? <clears throat> Students have many opportunities, as we all know, to cut corners. Uh, they can cheat on exams, they can plagiarize term papers. They, we've even seen PhD students, right, falsify results, research results, right, to get into major top tier journals and publications. Um, technology has really both enhanced the ability of students to cheat, but has also served as a real good deterrent, right? I was, I was the first professor at Eller to bring turnitin.com to the college decades ago. And uh, so, so we've had that technology and it continues to be used. Now, when students get caught, after we understand their motivation and the opportunity and, and you get to brass tacks, right? You know, why did you do this? Well, it's interesting. Students rationalize their behavior in a number of ways. One of the things they say is that everyone else is doing it. You know, if you look in that large class, I mean, I can't find anyone that's not cheating in some way, shape, or form. So I have to keep up with the Joneses. Sound familiar? Or else I'm at a competitive disadvantage. How do you like having students flip the tables on you talking about competitive advantage in a cheating context, right? That's always kind of an interesting thought. Uh, students claim ignorance. You ever done that before? I didn't know I was cheating. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was just taking a passage that I thought everyone else was really familiar with, you know, and, and just using it because it's common language. Right? Maybe an interesting argument, but it's still, in my opinion, a, a rationalization. Sometimes we have students say, you know what, this class is really unfair. So unfair, in fact, that I had to kind of restore some justice personally, right, and take back some ground. And so I had to do what I had to do to make it fair, right? These are all classic examples that I've actually heard. So the root causes of unethical behavior are clearly in display, you know, when I look at it from a classroom standpoint. Obviously, they're also a corporate stand, from a corporate standpoint. So let, let's talk about this now and, and pivot from classroom to corporate. Many of you have probably heard the company Helps Up. You want to hear the Helps Up? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this was a book written by Aaron Beam. I actually know Aaron. I've known him for many years. He reached out to me after he got out of prison and said, as part of my um, public service, I have to give talks. 
And I was wondering if I could come to the University of Arizona Eller College of Management and, and be a speaker at your Center for Leadership Ethics. And I thought, absolutely. And of course, I had to deal with some backlash from some other business professors. How could you bring a convicted, you know, felon to campus? And I said, well, why wouldn't we? You know, he went to prison. He served his time. He's not going to be, you know, acting in any, you know, significant way in the, in the markets. And he is actually trying to, you know, do some community service. And by the way, it's not just telling our students what they should do. It's also illustrating what can happen when you don't do the right thing. And then they back down, as they usually do. Okay, I think he's got a good argument. So brought Aaron to campus, couldn't resist, did something that was really on the cutting edge. We did our first YouTube interview. This is a big deal, right? I mean, today it's the owl back many decades ago. It was a YouTube video, right? So I decided to interview Aaron and I said, Aaron, I want to ask you a few questions. I want to test out these root causes of unethical behavior. So I interviewed and here's what I learned, right? What was the motivation? Well, like any other company, right? They were under enormous pressure to hit their targets, right? And we all know that brokers and analysts set kind of corporate performance, right? So if a company doesn't hit, what happens? It's taken as bad news and this can lead to the domino effect, right? Where you not only have individual but institutional investors begin to exercise their options and move along, right? So that was the motivation. I felt kind of strange asking about the opportunity because here's a, a CFO of the company, right? The, the founding CFO. I was expecting this exotic Enron style mark to market accounting and it was none of that. <laughs> he basically said, no, we, we basically did one of two things. We accelerated uh, revenue recognition, right? Which is kind of like pre-booking sales, right? While also at the same point, at the same time deferring uh, expense uh, recognition, which is post-dating checks, if you will, right? Those are just some of the most simple basic examples. Uh, that they use. It's crazy because it's like the mouse in the little wheel that keeps going faster and faster. It's totally unsustainable. At some point, it's going to stop. And the revenue that you rob, right, for a future quarter is going to be needed. And those do those bills are going to come due, right? So it's it's crazy, but that's how that's how we did it. The rationalization was fascinating. What Aaron told me was that, you know, for one thing, he believed that all other CFOs at that particular point in time we're engaging in these kinds of shenanigans. Now, some of us do a content analysis and go back and look at points in time, and there is some evidence. It doesn't make it, doesn't make it right, but there are many examples of CFOs that were doing this activity at this particular time, okay? Remember, it's a rationalization. He would call it an excuse, I would call it a rationalization. He also cited that he was getting enormous pressure from the CEO, Richard Scrushy, who was a classic narcissist. You know, we don't want to ever try to judge people, but we, there's been a lot of people that have analyzed him, and he was a scary guy. And when he wanted to do something, he made it very clear. He had bodyguards that would walk around with a cold black blue steel on their hip. You know, there was even uh, one person that committed suicide, right, that worked for the company. And, and this was a very small company in terms of where its HQ was, and these people knew each other, which kind of leads also to this third point which kind of explains the fear and, and, and the social pressures that he and others are facing. And that was that at this time, what he should have done, which was, you know, to engage in some good old fashioned belt tightening, you know, there's a couple of ways you either grow revenue, right? And if you can't grow the revenue, you got to start cutting some of your costs, right? So he didn't do those things because he found it difficult for him to lay people off, interestingly enough, that were hard workers coming in, you know, eight to five, minding their P's and Q's, you know, good law-abiding citizens. Why should they be laid off if we're doing all these things on the back? I know these people, right? They go to church with me. I see them at the supermarkets. Our kids go to school together. He couldn't bring himself to making those tough decisions and having to bear the consequences of seeing those people uh, the next day. Okay, how are we doing on time so far, Heather? Well, we started a little bit late, so I think you're fine. It's 1226 Perfect. right now. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, no, no. I just want to make sure we're, we're good here. So we have plenty of time for a little bit of discussion. Mm -hmm. So here is the uh, ethical gray zone, which I uh, made reference to earlier. And what I'd like to do is share with you a couple of examples of real time examples that are playing out. And if you recall my approach from the onset, right, when I talk about breaches of trust in society, I highlighted a business, government, and nonprofit sector. I'm going to do the same here. Okay. So let's go with the first one. 
interesting, right? Heather, because we were talking a little bit about this, right? Here's one that, that's in an ethical gray zone. Employers requiring employees to get vaccinated. Is this a hot button issue? Yeah. Well, here's the thing that makes it really interesting. Legally, it is permissible. So long as employers do what? They, they take account of people's underlying health conditions or religious objections, right? But for the most part, you can do this legally. The big question is, is it ethical? And that's where there's an interesting uh, kind of discussion, right? We even kind of right. talked a little bit about this before we began. So this is one of those right now that falls into this interesting uh, ethical gray zone. Here's another one. I have asked this question for years and, and rarely can I get anyone that can even hit the side of the bar. This is a government example of we use. Does anyone want to try to be creative? <laughs> I'm going to give you a, 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 a fist pump. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Eminent domain is an excellent, a wonderful example of the ethical gray zone, right? Because government, right, whether you think of it at the local, state, or federal levels, it can do it legally, right? Why? Because the argument is made that you need to look at what's in the interest of the, you know, for the public good. But is it ethical? And, and where it gets to be an interesting question is when you have eminent domain getting exercised in, say, parts of Virginia to have, whether it's a new soccer stadium or baseball stadium, put up and you have displaced people, right? Some people might say, hmm, that's an interesting use of eminent domain. Now, if you say the other example would be putting in a highway you don't get as much resistance. You still will have people say it may be legal, but man, is it ethical to displace people that lived in their homes, you know, for generations? But the use of eminent domain, the right? TCC is a great example. <laughs> the well, that was really close to home, but yes, yes, I would <laughs> completely great. agree. This is the fun part about this is that there are examples and, and references that we can make without even leaving this room, right? Here's one from the nonprofit sector. Now, you've heard of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm gonna share something with you and, and let you think a little bit about this because it's another great example of something that was legal, but there were big questions as far as it was, whether it was ethical. Um, David Williams was the CEO of the Make-A-Wish Foundation for many years. I happened to have the good fortune of having his son, son take one of my classes. We struck up a conversation after class one day, and he mentioned that his dad worked for the Make-A-Wish. I said, oh, we should bring him down to Tucson, you know, have him give a guest talk. He did. He shared a story, and I remember being mesmerized. And in fact, I said, David, I'm going to write up a case on this because this is just so good. So here's what happens. Let's see if this, if this uh, jogs your memory a little bit. There was a teenage boy in, uh, that, that had a how shall I say, a life-threatening um, disease. So we reached out to the Make-A-Wish Foundation, which is in the business of granting wishes, right? Except his wish was that he wanted to go on a Kodiak bear hunt. So the Make-A-Wish Foundation was in a real dilemma, right? You got your, your national chapter, and then you have your local chapters, right? And, and there's they, they like to exercise some, some some flexibility and discretion. What did the Make-A-Wish Foundation do? Well, it went, once the word got out about this, it became a huge media firestorm, right? By the way, going to um, hunt a Kodiak bear is legal in some states, right? But what a lot of people were concerned with, with was, is it right for a Make-A-Wish Foundation, right, to be associating itself with these types of wishes? They were like, whatever happened to these kids wanting to go to Disneyland? Right, or going to go on a big shopping spree, you know, why this particular wish? They kind of sidestepped it and outsourced, if you will, this wish to the Safari Club, right? Who, you know, found a way not only to get someone to, you know, kind of donate their tag for, for the hunt, but also a rifle and all the gear and all the travel. Still didn't mean that the organization was not um, really seriously uh, hit by some negative PR because as powerful as some of those organizations that would be pro hunt. We've also got the Humane Society, right? Because you've got celebrities that would really profess, look, this is about guns, right? And, and our freedom. You'd have other celebrities that would say, no, 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 this is this is just kind of beyond the pale, right? So it was this really big, heavyweight, you know, uh, 
about that went on. So another example of you know uh, a dilemma that could come up, an ethical dilemma that meets you know this criteria of, of the ethical gray zone. So here's a copy of the book. Um, and the reason I wanted to share this was because I'm going to talk to you now about why I wrote this book and why it, it, I use it not only for my classes, but also with a lot of work that I do with, with organizations. And uh, illustration. You love, I spent years trying to find this. I love it. It, 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 I, I'm one of those that can obsess with images. As you can probably tell, I'm very particular about certain ways that I convey because I learn from imagery. Like this image here in my mind, I don't know if some of you operate the same way, can open a folder that I can talk for two minutes or two hours just on this one slide. <laughs> so, so this really captures for me what I call the moral problems in management. So if you're wondering what, is, what do I mean by moral problems in management, it's how do managers balance <clears throat> financial and social performance. Uh, financial performance is pretty easy, right? We, we think of, you know, we think of revenues, costs, and profits, right? It's pretty standard. But how about social performance, right? Social performance is, is, is a little more difficult to measure, but still really important for the overall health and well-being of broad stakeholders. And when I have people ask, well, what do you mean by stakeholders? Do you mean shareholders? No. I mean stakeholders, right? A shareholder can be a stakeholder, but a stakeholder isn't always a shareholder. And that kind of leads into a, a, a little bit more of a discussion we're going to have. But um, this balancing of financial and social performance, like the M.C. Escher illusion, in my opinion, it's always been there. It will always be there. This will has always been a challenge, you know, for management and leaders and business, and will always be. So let me just give you a couple of examples that illustrate this this uh, these moral problems in management. Let's say, for example, that you are a manager and you're trying to balance, okay the capital cost of installing pollution control filters in a, in, a, in a power plant, okay? That's got one of the, it's an example of this balancing, right? Let's say, for example, that you're a manager <clears throat> in a large commercial feed company, and you're trying to balance the operating costs of having free range chickens, right? For the marketplace. Or let's say, for example, you're a manager uh, and you're heading up a large garment company and you're trying to balance the labor costs of improving working conditions for people in third world countries, right? If any of you as managers or leaders of these firms decide that you want to make these changes, right? It's going to impact your bottom line. Would we agree? It can be expensive. If you don't do it, there's a very good chance that you're gonna get some social pushback, which is going to complicate matters. And so for me, for, for decades, what I've been trying to get really senior people to understand and also students is that it's a false thought that you have to choose an either or. My argument is you have to do both and, and when they say and what, and whatever the future may dictate, because this is part of really successful firms is being agile, right? If we had had this conversation 20, 40, 60 years ago, some of these concepts would be new. Business changes, right? People change, and so do expectations. And that's one of the big, big arguments that I make here is that you need to kind of have a change in mindset from you got to do either or to a both and. That's kind of the key. So here is at a really high level. Uh, the objective model of analysis. And you're, I know you're putting your glasses on. Probably if you don't have an astigmatism, you, you will have to try to read this. <laughs> By the way, uh, Heather, just to make sure I'm staying in the alphabet, I'm going to make this available. Perfect. Um, I was thinking that already. Absolutely. I was I'm, I'm, you I'm happy to do so. And I'm also happy to um, continue the conversation with anyone that, that's, uh, that's a member um, because it's quite often after people hear this, they're like, hmm. Questions. Well, questions, and I'd like to have my senior people or some of my mid-level people, you know, have this benefit. And, and uh, one of the other things, because of the extensive case writing that I do that I back up to the model, it really is unusual. So you get, you get it finally integrated. It's, the, it's what I call the red thread that you can pull through everything. Mm -hmm. So the objective model of analysis 
you know, is, is what I say you should try to use when you're facing these moral problems in management. Okay, how do you work your way through this? The first step is to do what I call a really intense stakeholder interest. And, and stakeholder interest, it's all about inclusive considerations, right? It's not just shareholders, it's broad stakeholders. It's not just customers, it's employees. It's not just suppliers, it's distributors, right? It's not just government agencies, but kind of civilians in general, right? Society, right? The environment. A lot of times I'll get people say in a very sophisticated way, wait, isn't everyone a stakeholder? And they kind of laugh and kind of rub their elbows. And, yeah. Well, wouldn't that be just really impractical to consider everyone's interests? And I said, no, that's actually part of being ethical. Nobody said it would be easier expedient. The hard work of, of really doing the right thing means that you really have to put the time in. So if you're looking for a quick answer, you can go take another class because that's not going to be what we're going to be discussing, right? So it starts with a really robust uh, stakeholder interest, right? As I say, you're considering the benefits and harms, rights exercise, and rights denied for the full society. That's your first step. The second step, which all of you should be very comfortable with, is to look at the economic outcomes, right? Economic outcomes are based on in personal market forces, right? Which is what we should have in kind of our free market economy. This is when you're trying to determine the net balance of benefits over costs for the full society. How do you balance short-term gains with long-term implications, right? That's not easy. It sounds easy, but when you're actually in the seat, right? Of, of having to make those decisions, that is much more difficult to do. Right? It can be very tempting because of all the pressures right, to do things here and now and, and defer some of those costs and, and make some of those longer term decisions that, that might be best for the firm. So that's the second step. The third step is legal requirements. And with legal requirements, this is all about um, impersonal um, social and political processes, which basically give us our legal, uh, our, our laws and regulations in society, right? So it's, it's reviewing laws adopted by members of society to regulate uh, the behavior of those members of society. Here's the tricky part about laws, and I'm sure that all of you can probably agree and relate to. Um, there's not a law for every circumstance that comes up. Right? And in fact, what I think many of you would probably agree with is we, we usually have to have some kind of market failure in order for people to take a financial hit or people you know, get injured or, or even worse, die. And then we have this convulsion, right? And then everybody starts putting enormous pressures, right, on, on elected officials to pass laws. And as soon as we pass a law because of innovation and, and creativity in the marketplace, there's another little gap that presents itself. And it's like whack-a-mole, right? We start the process over and over and over again. Last but not least, you have ethical duties, right? And, and this is based on what I like to call universal indelible truths, right? These things that cut across all cult cultures and times that bind us as people, right? It's evaluating the obligations that we owe members of society by other members of society, okay? I wanna kind of uh, delve a little bit deeper here on ethical duties because this is the area that I don't think we still spend enough time with. So, at the risk of oversimplifying, right? In, in, in that textbook that I have, I probably have 15 different schools of philosophic thought. Now, if I went through a quarter of those, your eyes would probably roll back like Linda Blair in The Exorcist, and I'd lose you for the rest of the afternoon. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of just boil this down to two schools, which are really interesting because they're so different. They're, they're actually diametric. And while the terms may sound familiar, or maybe they don't, the concepts you use, I'm quite confident every day in personal and, and professional situations. So the first school is what we call a consequential school, right? It's a results-based approach. And, and the principle here is that the ends justify the means. How many of you have heard of that term kind of kicked around, right? Well, that's very different from another school, which is the deontological school, right? Which for me, it's more simple to call the rules-based approach. And here, you have people that are making decisions and, and taking actions with the means justifying means. Now, if you look at these two principles, they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. So let me give you a fun way of illustrating this, which if any of you have children, 
<clears throat> or maybe you just really enjoy cartoons or, or action films, you can relate to. Who's seen The Dark Knight? Any Batman fans here? Yeah, I think you've heard of it. You kind of heard the narrative, right? Joker and Batman, right? You got two schools of philosophic thought. So Batman, if he takes this results-based approach, right? The ends justify the means, could say, I'm going to kill Joker. Because by killing Joker, I'm going to be saving how many countless lives, right? Or he could take the uh, rules-based approach where the means justify the ends and say, look, no matter how much we may despise Joker, he's still a human and he has rights. And under no circumstances can I justify, right, killing another human, right, because the means cannot justify the ends. Pretty plain, pretty simple, right, straightforward. Here's another example, which is not a comic. It's actually quite serious, and many of us have, may recall having to think about what's, what's the right thing to do. Uh, you know that torture occurs, right? It hasn't been as popular in the, in, in the mainstream media as it maybe was a few years ago, but you also have these two different philosophic approaches that can rationalize in some way, shape, or form the use or the not using torture, right? If you take on the results-based approach, <clears throat> and you've probably heard people say this, if you capture a terrorist and you think that they have information that could save other people's lives, well, then you do what you have to do to extract that information, right? And in this case, the means justify the ends. You've heard this before, right? Well, there's a whole other group of people would say, no, 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 wait a second. As much as we may despise these terrorists, right? They're still humans. They still have rights, even if they're not U.S. citizens. And under no circumstances can you justify torture, right? Because the means cannot justify the ends. So these two examples kind of illustrate one in a comic sense and one in a much more serious way, how these two schools are so different and can take you different places. The thing that I really want to emphasize um, with these two schools is this. <clears throat> They're both trying to help us determine right from wrong. When we talk about a results-based approach in, in my very simplistic way of explaining this in a way that, that can be real and, and actually can be understood and applied, is there, it's trying to, trying to help us determine what's right from wrong, right? Here you have a lot of people say with the results-based approach, we're trying to achieve the greatest benefit for the greatest number. Does that sound familiar, right? Um, the problem is sometimes decisions that you make may lead to some questionable outcomes. What would happen, Heather, if I proposed to the entire group here that I, we should enslave 98% of the population? Actually, let me flip that around. We should enslave 2% of the population so that 98% of us can be happier, wealthier, and happier. Many could argue that, well, you know, that ends justifies the means, right? If you can get 98% of benefit, right, for people, you know, at the expense of two, you would say, well, that, that seems like a pretty good swap. I would think that most of you would probably object and say, well, I don't know if that feels good or if that's right. Would you agree? Well, over here on this uh, rules-based approach, again, it's we're trying to help people determine right from wrong. Here with the rules-based, it's interesting. It's all about things like you're not supposed to lie, cheat, or steal, right? And if you like rules, <clears throat> they're easy to follow. But sometimes following the rules can, again, lead to results that leave you scratching your head saying, how did I end up here, right? If you're a software engineer, right? And you notice that a nuclear weapon gets detonated, you could, and you might have the ability to hack into that system to prevent the launch, but the rule would suggest that is not acceptable, so you don't do it. And by not doing it, we have thousands, if not millions of people die. Now, the means justify the ends, but most people would say, is this really acceptable? Or would we expect more people, right? So this is what's interesting about these schools of thought is that they're very different, but they can lead you to very different outcomes, which is why it's important to get a really good grounding if you're gonna understand that part of the model, which kind of gets to uh, ethical uh, implications. Okay, so how are we doing at time so far? About 9.46. Perfect, we're, we're right, we're tracking well. So how many of you have read or heard about 
deep sea monkey. Well, see, that's why you came to knowledge at noon, <laughs> right? You're gonna get you're gonna get some some insights here. Well, this this is um, this was my most recent case that I wrote. And as any good professor that writes a case, you, you want to make sure that you're aligned with the realities of the marketplace. So I write it and then I float it by some senior people in key sectors. I get some really good inputs and it just makes it better. This case is going to be fantastic and it's going to be really interesting to see how people analyze it. And this also will tie into the last thing I'm going to talk about, which is an invitation for the Tucson Metro Chamber. Um, so let me give you a little bit of, of context here, right? So at the very bottom of some of the deepest parts of the ocean, right? This, we have this area called the abyssal plains, right? Which happens to be in this area between Hawaii and Mexico. There are trillions of these little potato sized rocks. They're called polychromatic uh, nodules. And they're literally just laying on the seabed floor, kind of like golf balls or Easter eggs, just almost inviting us to go and pick them up. And why is there so much interest about these? Well, because they only happen to contain some of the world's most rare minerals. The minerals, as it turns out, that we're going to need if we want to decarbonize society. We want to move the needle with electric vehicles, or we want to have better, more efficient you know, more environmentally friendly, you know, power generation. These elements and minerals are going to be crucial to be able to, you know, uh, make that jump. So I can argue to you that from a stakeholder standpoint, we have everyone impacted for better or worse, right? The work will come in thinking about not just the shareholders of the companies, the mining companies that could benefit, right, from this and the companies that use these rare earth minerals and and, and elements to, to you know, create new products, right? And, and, and allow new services. It's getting much, much deeper. So that's kind of like, remember what we talked about with the objective model of analysis, looking at an ethical dilemma, unpacking it in a way that you're attending to all those key components. Okay, that's the first one. From an economic standpoint, oh boy. Um, we are talking about trillions of dollars. And they are just now, the, 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 econometric, the, the economists are basically trying to figure out valuations. You know, you're very familiar, I'm sure all of you, with oil reserves and futures, right? They're trying to do the same thing, but we're talking about trillions of dollars. So the lure is incredible, and it's drawing not just countries, but large companies everybody's trying to pounce on this opportunity. So there's your economic elements, right? There could be some real short and long-term benefits, but there could be some real short-term and long-term problems, you know, that they could fall. Legally, this is what's so interesting. How many of you have heard of the United Nations, right? So here's what's really interesting from a legal standpoint. Any country, right, has primacy over anything in the ocean 200 nautical miles off their shore. So think of it, let that kind of sit with you for a minute. So for the United States, you think of like Southern California, which I'm going to be at, you know, this weekend as well. Think of like San Diego, you think of La Jolla, you know, 200 miles out from the shoreline, you know, the U.S. has to make. It can do whatever it wants or what it doesn't want to do in those 200 miles. The real question is, well, then who governs everything else? And it's the United Nations. There's a, a seabed authority that just happens to be located in Jamaica <laughs> and just so happens to be drafting right now the regs that will allow countries and companies to be able to get licenses for exploration and development and eventually the market realization of these nodules. You see where we're going? It's very unclear right now how this is going to play out because the laws and regs are getting drafted as we speak. What's interesting, and this is where it gets really, really kind of scary for some, is that remember what I said earlier that countries have domain over 
they're, those 200 nautical miles from their shoreline. There are countries right now that are saying, we're within 150 miles of our ocean. Are there any companies or countries that would like to partner with us because we think there's a bounty here? We're gonna do a swap, right? It's kind of like an arbitrage, right? Maybe we don't have the technologies to be able to do the mining, but you do. So we'll take you on, we'll sponsor you as part of our country domain to get to these nodules and you're going to adequately compensate us, right? When you bring these wonderful nodules to the surface. So there are countries that can do this without anyone having any say over Now, which countries do you think are really interested in this? China, uh -huh. Russia, United States. No, no. Yeah, this is really interesting. In fact, the U.S. is the only country that is not signed off on this U.N. Pact. Kind of interesting, right? I know you're you're sitting there going, "Hmm, the plot thickens." Yeah, but so legally, there's a lot afoot here. Ethically, right? I can sit here and make a very strong argument that. If it's all about um, the future and sustainability and trying to reduce our reliance, right, on, on, you know, fuels or energy sources that are not renewable, right, um, you know, this is, this is, this is inevitable, right? Leave it to us and our imagination and innovation and entrepreneurship and, and markets to find ways to do this. Who's going to argue that, right? Yes. Is there an environmental impact? Of, of collecting these polychromatic numbers. Well, that's so funny you mentioned that. You see, you just, you just, I, this, you, sometimes you can't script this. <laughs> the other side of the argument is exactly that. You've got scientists saying, don't tap on the brakes, lock the brakes up. We are, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do some of these areas in the deepest parts of the sea. There are microorganisms, there are plant life, there is a whole ecosystem that is very delicate and that we don't know anything about. So the science is saying, look, we already know because there have been some experiments with this. And this is why I wanted to use this, this illustration here uh, was because I think it really helps people. Remember what I talked about visual? I spent about a week trying to find this. This to me captures in one slide a way for you to think about this. You get this ship you know, drops down this harvester that kind of just kind of like a vacuum cleaner, you know, vacuums up all these nodules, it gets pumped up to the, to the top here, they drop down the plumes of all the stuff that you don't need. Well, not only do you have damage going on here, and there's very big questions about what the plumes do. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, did I mention to you that these, polo, uh, the, these uh, polychromatic uh, nodules, they only take millions of years to become what they are. Because they're based on sediment, fossils. There are parts of the ocean that may only have one or two particulates drop within a year. And when this has been done, there's footage and, and pictures from when this was done in the 70s. You would think it was done yesterday. This environment doesn't change at all in, in our lifetime in real time. So the ethical concern is what are we doing? You know, it, is what we don't know really going to hurt us more than anything that we do know? And that there needs to be science, there needs to be study, we need to section off parts of the ocean floor where, where none of this can occur. That sounds fine, except there's the pressure and the urgency, right, to try to become departments. And so this title that I use for the case, right, <clears throat> the clock is ticking, deep sea mining. I always leave these cases within the form of a question, right? Because I think the question is inviting to a reader. Right. Think about it, right? I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm going to maybe unpack it in a way that will help you kind of see the critical elements, right? And leave it to you to balance what you want to emphasize. Um, by the way, these cases that I write are, are really kind of unique. I, I've written cases on the Boeing 737 MAX dilemma. Right? Cases on Huawei. How many of you have heard of Huawei, right? And, and their push for 5G in the EU and some of the resistance that they've met up with, with the US and other Western countries. AI. How many of you are interested in AI? Fascinating technology, right? But are there some potential negative side effects that can come with, yeah. with, with AI, right? Not, not the least of which is facial recognition. You know, the technology that recognizes your face as, as a white female is going to be different than, say, an African-American female. 
And when you're talking about law enforcement using their body cameras that have been fitted with AI facial recognition, uh, that's a that's that's a big deal, right? You, we're already having difficulties, right? In society with with expectations and, and and calls for changing of policing, right? And now this technology, which should be able to do a lot of good, can only potentially start the pot if you don't understand it, right? So these cases that I write are really topical in nature. I try to capture the things that are happening right here, right now, to get students and to get senior leaders to really use the model in a way that was intended, right? You deliberately think about the case and you use the structure of the objective model analysis to, to refine your thinking. This leads to, how are we doing a time? Good time, Heather. We have the last few minutes, five minutes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. This is my invitation to everyone that's here and everyone that will watch the, the recording. Um, this October, uh, which will be October 14th and 15th, I'll be hosting uh, the, the Center for Leadership's Ethics 19th Annual Collegiate Ethics Case Competition. We bring students from all over the world, Canada, the US, and Mexico. Imagine the top universities and business schools getting invited. Who are they going to send? Their best and brightest. And so what I have done for 19 years is I write a new case so they can't go out and get a Harvard case and study up with the professor's notes. Um, I, I neutralize that, right? By me writing the case and giving it to them at the, at the exact same time, telling them you have to use this model of analysis to unpack the case, it neutralizes big, small schools, publics, and privates. This year will be our 19th annual. This year's case will involve the case I just kind of gave you a little bit of a, of a prelude to, deep sea mining, right? And what I want to do is I want to invite the Tucson Chamber of Commerce and any, any of the members that would have an interest in being a judge. How many of you would like to have, do you have a fountain of youth at your home or work? Um, no. Would you like one? I'm not so sure. Well, for those of you that like to, to, to you know, enjoy the family, you, all you got to do is come to this competition. <laughs> you will become younger in mind and wow. in spirit because when you see these students from all over the world, I mean, locking in on an analysis. Look, I've had experiences where I have written these cases. I thought I researched this to the very ends of earth. And then I have these students come from Wharton. I have these students come from, from, from Dalhousie. I have students come from Unam in Mexico. And they start sharing ideas and thoughts. And, and the hairs are going up on my arms. I'm like, I never even thought of that. Something magical happens. And the whole, out, the whole goal of this is to raise people's awareness to really drive home the importance of good decision-making, which O can have an ethical overtone to it, and trying to prepare our leaders and our current leaders, future and present, for these issues that are pressing, right? So I want to extend an invitation to oh, the, the Tucson Metro Chamber. And here is uh, my contact info, should anyone you know, wanna uh, circle back with me. And I think we're at time. I don't know if we have a couple of minutes for a few yeah, questions. Yeah, let's do, but... start a little late. So let's okay. keep talking a little bit. I'm so curious about, this is such an interesting path that you've taken with your career. Was there something that either happened, whether it be along your educational process or personally where you had that aha moment and you just fell in love with ethics? Like what was it that led you down this path? Great question. We have a dean in the Eller College, a former dean by the name of Dr. Ken Smith. Mm -hmm. The name of the building, we, we, we honor him. We also have another dean in the college named Dr. Pamela Perry, who happens to be our MBA dean right now. Enron broke. Yeah. And then I got called to the dean's office. I'm thinking, how does a professor get called? Oh, what did I do wrong? You get nervous thinking about it. I'm like, what's up, Dr. Smith? He's like, take a seat. Oh, no. Our competition said, I need you to do something. Okay, what? You need to develop the college's first ethics class. Okay, why? Enron, I'm getting calls. Alumni, big companies. What is the Eller College doing to try to address this to make sure that we don't have one of our students do what some of these executives at Enron and WorldCom and Adelphia have been doing? So we were responding to these huge ethical scandals, which if you go back in time, maps almost perfectly with my journey, which started 
with a class, which would eventually over many years turn into a set. Because one of the arguments I made to, to Dr. Smith was the class is great. We're trying to change the culture. And to do that means we got to look at this at a much higher level and build pieces. He's like, can you do that? I'm like, I don't know. I think I can. He's mm -hmm. like, I'll support you. And that's the key here that I, I will share with everyone. When you've got good leadership mm -hmm. that trusts you, gives you a long leash, which I needed, mm -hmm. and, and also accounts or gives you a few points, knowing that you're not always going to get it right, you can usually uh, make, make good. So that's how this all started. Great story. Yeah, that's how it began. Yeah. yeah. By the way, as an economist, Dr. Smith said, you know, I want you to teach a class. I said, sure. Uh, I, I think we should do multiple sections to 25. You know what his response was? <laughs> He's like, I'm an economist. It's all about economies of scale. You're going to do it to 250. I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> right? And, and that's how we started. Uh, and, and there were there were critics saying, I don't know if you can even do that. I'm like, no, this is, this is a good way to disprove you. This is also why my approach to teaching ethics is not about what you should be thinking or what you've done. It's about decision making. It's about how can I give you a tool that can help you give you a competitive advantage when everything else is equal to have a way of in a real cerebral way to analyze ethical dilemmas in, in a way that's not just what you think and feel. Remember back to my point, I think we should do this. And then you say, I think differently. Well, I feel that we should do that. I feel different. And then we get stuck in this morass, right? If you take away the subjective and you get into objective criteria and say, hey, look, we're all together on this, right? Here are the criteria we're going to agree on. Let's work our way. That's that unifies people. You know, and you get away from the subjective. So yeah, you're welcome. Well, thank you so much for coming oh, in today. And I will share the list of uh, participants with you so you can just shoot them a quick email sure. so they have this information. And then if you do want to share your PowerPoint, we can Absolutely. give them a link to that as well, just because happy to. especially your illustrations are so phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd be happy to. And I, I really love to find ways to uh, partner even more so, which is why when we talked and, and I spoke with Amber, I, I really love, I, I know a lot of you are involved in the university in different ways in the college, but I, I'm gonna try to make that another opportunity. And, and we got a great one coming up here. So if anyone yeah, is interested- Yeah, count me in that. Oh, wonderful. That's fascinating. Okay, yeah. fantastic, yeah. fantastic. All right. All right, well, thank, thank you everyone. So much. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for everyone online for showing up too. We appreciate it.